Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're out at the range with a replica of a Griswold and Gunnison. Now, this is a gun that the Confederates used during the Civil War, was manufactured in the South. And this particular replica is one that I put together myself out of parts. Though you can get them at Cabela's, Dixie Gun Works, and a number of other outlets if you just look around. Uh, but let me tell you what I was doing with this one, and then we'll take it out and put it through its paces. Griswold and Gunnison revolvers were produced by Samuel Griswold and Arvin W. Gunnison. Uh, Griswold was a Connecticut entrepreneur who moved to Georgia in 1835 when he was 45 years old. And when he got to Georgia, he started a number of businesses. In 1862, he teamed up with a New Orleans gunmaker who was a refugee after the Union forces took New Orleans, named Arvin W. Gunnison, and they got a contract to make handguns for the Confederate Army. Now, during the Civil War, the official sidearm of the Confederacy was the 36 caliber uh, Colt 1851 Navy revolver. And that's what the Confederacy wanted Griswold and Gunnison to make. And they came pretty close, though the Griswold differs uh, from the Navy in several important features. First of all, most of them had brass frames, uh, though there were a few with iron frames. Second, if you look at the barrel, you can see it has a rounded profile uh, for the forward part, like a uh, Colt Dragoon. So those are the two very visible differences. Now, the cylinders and the barrels on original Griswolds were made of iron, not steel, the way Colt would have been. And the frames usually had kind of a pinkish color because they had a very high copper content uh, due to zinc shortages during the Civil War. And Griswold and Gunnison only made about 3,600 of these, and they sold each one for 40 bucks. At the same time, Colt was charging the U.S. Army and Navy $13.75 for one of their Navy revolvers. Uh, production lasted until 1864, when General Sherman's March to the Sea basically put him out of business. So now that you know a little bit of the history of real Griswold and Gunnison revolvers, let me tell you about mine, which is just a little bit different, and there's a reason for that. Well, I'm a big fan of the TV show Hell on Wheels, and as much as I like that show, they get a lot of stuff wrong, particularly the weaponry, though they're getting a little bit better as, as the years go by. But when the show started... Cullen Bohannon, who's the, the main character of the show, uh, is a returning Confederate officer, and supposedly he is armed with a Griswold and Gunnison revolver. But of course, the revolver they're using on the show looks nothing like a Griswold and Gunnison. What it is is a brass-framed 1860 Colt Army revolver. And of course, there was no such thing as a brass-framed 1860 Colt Army revolver until the Italians started making them in the 1970s. So anyway, they kind of got that wrong, but it got me interested in recreating Cullen Bohannon's gun and a gun that would look like a real Griswold and Gunnison, and that's how this came about. So in order to make my fantasy Griswold revolver, I had to make a compromise. Original Griswold and Gunnison's were 36 caliber revolvers. But in order to convert this between a Griswold look and an 1860 Army look, uh, I needed to use a 44 caliber revolver because the 1860 Army is 44 caliber. So what I decided to do was start with another gun that never existed which is a brass-framed 1851 Colt Navy revolver, and use that as my base gun. So for me, going from a brass-framed 44 caliber 1851 Navy to the Bohannon Griswold was pretty easy. It just meant a trip to my parts bin, uh, where I had some Hanger Queen parts from 1860 armies uh, hanging around for the last you know, probably 10 or 15 years. So I just went digging around through them, and uh, 
I extracted a barrel assembly, and as you can see, this one at some point I had dovetailed a much higher front sight on. And then I took a grip frame uh, out of the parts bin, and removed it from its frame assembly, which had some problems. And from there, I was able to put together uh, my equivalent of the Bohannon Griswold. So to put together the actual Griswoldy looking Griswold, I needed a 44 caliber Griswold barrel. And amazingly, I've got probably a half dozen of these in my parts bin, but none of them would fit the Pieta frame. So I went out to my friends at EMF, and I had been looking for an 1860 Army barrel for another reason, but they had one of these 44 caliber, essentially Griswold barrels, in their parts bin, which they sold me. And from there, I was good to go. So it was a pretty simple matter to swap out barrel assemblies and just pull off the Navy barrel and put on the Griswold and Gunnison barrel. And then voila, well, got a uh, Griswold and Gunnison, but in 44 caliber that converts with the Bohannon gun. Well, loading up the Griswold and Gunnison is basically the same as loading any other cap and ball revolver. Uh, so if you're familiar with that procedure, you're not going to see anything that you don't know here. But if you are not familiar with it, what you see here will actually carry over to any other cap and ball revolver you might want to do. So I'm going to start by putting it on half cock. I'm only going to load five chambers, even though this is equipped with safety pins and the way they operate is basically you lower the hammer on them and the hammer the hammer has a little slot in there which allows you to catch the pin and this is how they loaded six back in the 19th century and kept it safe but I'm only going to load five today and put the hammer on an empty chamber uh, because that's what I'm used to doing now, the first step is put it on half cock so that the cylinder will rotate freely. And I'm going to be loading from the can today. We're using 3F Go X black powder. I've got a pistol measure here. And I don't know if you'll be able to get enough resolution on that. I've got it set for 30 grains. So, just level that off. Take a chamber and pour it in. Not really that easy to do when you reach around a camera, but... All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this greased felt wad, and there is a video on the channel on making those, or you can buy them from Oxyoke. And now I'm taking one of my 454 diameter cast lead balls. And I'm just going to top that up, try to keep the sprue up. And we're going to get it under the loading lever and get it centered and then push it home. So I'm going to do that four more times and we'll be all loaded up. Well, the last step in the procedure is to cap them. Uh, I'm using Remington number 10 caps, which I find usually fit these Italian replicas the best. A lot of people have been asking me lately where I've been getting my caps. They've been having trouble getting them. And the answer is I'm having trouble getting them too. Well, luckily, I had several thousand of them stockpiled. But I'm getting down there now, and I am having trouble finding them. So I don't have an explanation, except they're making so much regular ammo. It's probably hard. I use this Ted Cash snail capper. Holds about 100 and it's very handy for getting on these Colt style guns. It's much easier than fumbling the caps home. Now, you can probably see the nipples are a little bit special. They've got a little hole drilled in the side, they're silver colored. These are Slicks shot nipples. I pretty much put them on all of my personal guns these days. Uh, they're very sure firing. And they, they prevent cap jams. So 
I like to put them on. They're about 36 bucks a set. A little bit pricey, I know, especially for a brass frame gun. But it's better than having the annoyance of uh, of having nipples fall off into the works and gum everything up. Now, the last step that I do is I take just the dowel and I make sure all the caps are fully seated. And if you don't do that, there's a good chance you'll get a misfire. And if you do it with your thumb instead of a stick, there's a good chance that someday you're going to have a split thumb when a cap goes off. So, we're all set. Got five loaded. I put it down on an empty chamber, and now we're ready to go. Well, Evil Roy must have done his rain dance today. So we're starting to get the little pitter-patter here. But I think we still got enough time to make him pay for that with the Griswold and Gunnison. Not bad shooting for a Johnny Reb gun. Well, let's give poor old Evil Roy a break and see how the Griswold and Gunnison does on some two liter bottles. Got him. Well, Federal Frank and his gang of carpetbaggers is out to bushwhack poor weary soldiers returning home after the war. And the only thing standing between us and an early grave is our trusty Griswold and Gunnison. Let's finish up with the carpetbaggers view of the Griswold and Gunnison revolver. <laughs> 